Last month, India added two new vaccines to its COVID-19 vaccination program. One of them is Corbivax. Corbivax is being hailed across the world for relying on technology that is accessible to low and middle income countries. The vaccine itself uses a specific part of the coronavirus, the spike protein, to trigger an immune response. But what makes this vaccine stand out is how easily it could be scaled up. The technology involves genetically engineering the gene for the spike protein and inserting it into a microbe like yeast, which will release copies of that very same protein. Some of the most commonly available vaccines like hepatitis B use this technology. Makers of this vaccine also decided to transfer this technology to various countries free of cost. In India, the Hyderabad-based Biological E is responsible for producing it, and the Indian government has already placed an order for 300 million doses. Today we have with us Dr. Peter Hotels, who along with Dr. Maria Elena Butazzi, developed this vaccine and made the decision to share it with the world with no strings attached. Dr. Hotels has researched vaccines for decades and is the Dean for the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College in the USA. Welcome to the print. Thanks so much for uh, having me and very nice description. So the first question I want to ask is, you know, we're two years into the pandemic. What were some of the challenges that you may have faced when it came to releasing this vaccine? And also, if you can tell us a bit about the story of the vaccine itself, since this isn't the first coronavirus that you have researched into. Right. So our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development at, at Baylor Medical College of Medicine has been making vaccines for parasitic infections and neglected diseases of poverty for the last 20 years. And about uh, 10 years ago, we adopted a coronavirus vaccine program for SARS and MERS. And then when the COVID-19 sequence came along, we used that same technology. And our approach has always been to make vaccines for resource poor settings, vaccines that are durable, um, that are uh, easy to scale up and produce in the billions of doses, uh, simple refrigeration, and ones that could be uh, uh, produced and delivered at low cost. So this is one of the lowest cost COVID-19 vaccines. It has a tr tremendous uh, safety profile, similar to, as you point out, the hepatitis uh, B vaccine uh, that's been around for three or four decades. And, and so as you go down the list, it checks a lot of the boxes that you would want for a global health uh, COVID vaccine. And and we feel very blessed and fortunate to be able to partner with Biological E in India. They're one of the top vaccine producers in India and really globally. And um, they have been uh, have been an extraordinary group of scientists to work with. Um, and we were able to do this very efficiently to transfer our technology and, um, and work with them on the co-development. But they're ultimately the ones in the lead who led the um, not only the, the scale of production, but also the clinical development plan and really did an outstanding job. And so I think this is another side story to this is the power of Indian vaccine developers. And this is really India's gift to the world that they can make vaccines for a pandemic uh, like COVID-19, but, but use it to benefit the whole world. So we feel very fortunate to be able to have the ability to uh, work with them. I think the only disappointment is we've not gotten a lot of help from the G7 countries, the group of seven countries. You know, they've been so focused on mRNA and adenovirus and particle vaccines, new technologies, that they didn't, did not give enough attention to vaccines for use in resource poor settings. I think, you know, if we had greater support, even a fraction of the support that, say, Moderna got, who knows, maybe the world would have been vaccinated by now. And we never would have seen seen or heard of Omicron in the first place. Mm -hmm. But at least now we can uh, get that going. And uh, we're very excited to be working with India. Can you walk us through the distribution plan for Corbivac? Well, the distribution plan is very much up to Biological E. They are working now with the Indian regulators, DCGI and the Indian government to make that plan on where to ship doses of the vaccine and, and how to begin that process. And this is presumably underway, but it's very much now in the hands of, of Biological E, and that's, that's deliberate. So we do not try to exercise control about how India does its clinical development, how it distributes the vaccine. It's meant to empower Indian government, Indian producers, the Indian people. There's this concept in globalization uh, called decolonization, and that's what we're about, decolonizing. We don't want, we don't want to 
dictate to BioE or the Indian people and the Indian government how to do that. They can make those very decisions very well on their own, as well as decisions about how to work with the World Health Organization and the COVAX sharing facility. That's really in their hands right now, and they're very capable hands. So right now, India is sort of experiencing the heat with Omicron. Over a span of a very few days, we've seen a sharp rise in cases. Has Corbivax been tested for Omicron, and how easily can it be modified for new variants? So what's happening right now is BioE, Biological E, is in collaboration with us. We've been testing the vaccine against a wide variety of variants, holding up very well better than most vaccines against the beta variant, the delta variant. We do not yet have the data specifically for Omicron. That should be forthcoming. But the hope is that the fact that the vaccine is standing up so well with delta and beta, that it should have um, a protective ability against Omicron. Uh, we'll, we'll know that more in the coming weeks as we get the Omicron pseudovirus and the actual virus. I want to talk a little bit about something you mentioned earlier, which was an interest in mRNA adenovirus vaccines. Why do you think there is a greater interest in, in the innovation of vaccines as opposed to using more tried and tested methods? I think this was the decision by the global policymakers to focus on speed and innovation. And look, I, you know, I'm an MD, PhD laboratory investigator. I love innovation as much as the next person. And it has a role. But the problem was that was the exclusive focus. It was the focus on rapidly immunizing smaller populations using mRNA. And they're very powerful vaccines. They have shortcomings too, like all vaccines, but they're powerful vaccines. The problem is there was never that ability to scale up to the level needed to vaccinate the Southern Hemisphere or low and middle income countries in the Global South, nine billion doses. Like any new technology, there's a learning curve to go from zero to nine billion. And I think that was the flaw in the policy. It was a science policy failure, not to take a step back and have that situational awareness and say, we also need some straightforward vaccines using older technologies that could be administered to people all across the world now. And um, now we're going to make up for lost time, I think, because of the outstanding production capability of BioE. They've said 150 million doses, I think, are ready to roll out, and they have the ability to make 100 million doses a month. So the hope is we'll be looking at maybe a billion doses over in 2022. India has its own indigenous homegrown vaccine that also uses what you call old school technology, which is you know, inactivated whole virus. So how does Covax compare with that? And what are your views also on, on Covax? Uh, Covax, and I don't know too much about. It's a, it's a whole inactivated virus vaccine. And you're right, it uses an older technology like, like ours does as well. Um, but I think, you know, this is the strength of Indian vaccine producers to make a wide range of vaccine. You have Serum Institute making the AstraZeneca vaccine known as Covishield. You have uh, Covaxin from Bharat. You have um, uh, Corbivax uh, from, from uh, our collaboration. And there are others to follow, DNA vaccines. And again, this reflects the horsepower of uh, Indian uh, vaccine producers. It's, I like it to call it India's gift to the world. So the Indian government is a little, is cheating booster doses with a little trepidation. Um, what are your views on how essential boosters are to secure immunity against new emerging variants? Have you done any research into it? And well, well, certainly boosters have been very fundamental to protection against both Delta and Omicron here in the U.S. I'd like to say that the mRNA vaccines were always, should have been considered three dose vaccines. So we needed that booster. So it wouldn't surprise me that we'll need boosters for many of the vaccines being produced in India. So for instance, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Covishield may need a booster. Some of the Chinese whole inactivated vaccines need a booster. Potentially our vaccine, the, the Corbivax could serve also not only as a standalone vaccine, but as a booster, and those discussions are underway, I believe, between Biological E and, and the Indian regulators. I think another possibility, although the vaccine has been released for emergency use in adults, uh, because of the safety profile, I'm optimistic it could be a very uh, important vaccine for children. 
So those clinical studies are also underway, pediatric studies, and hopefully we'll learn more about that soon. So potentially this vaccine could be one of the very important vaccines for global child health. So you've already mentioned vaccine colonialism in our conversation before, and you're very vocal also on social media about vaccine inequity. COVAX was set up initially to help mitigate the effects of vaccine inequity. Do you think they've been successful? What have been some of the laggards? Why hasn't it been as effective if if you have that opinion? I think as a delivery mechanism, as a sharing facility, it's still holding up. It's still robust. I think the problem has been the upstream, that there was a science policy failure, that there wasn't the vaccines that could be made available for the COVAX sharing to facility to share, to actually share. And again, again, I think it was just too much focus on innovation and speed and not enough attention to having a low cost, durable vaccine that could be delivered uh, in the billions of doses needed. And hopefully that'll be corrected now. Along the same lines, what what kind of overhaul do you think our healthcare system globally with supply chains, development, manufacturing, all of that, what do you need so that we we avoid a situation like this where there aren't emerging variants coming from the global side? Well, I think part of the problem is we're too dependent on the multinational pharmaceutical companies. Um, they do a good job and they, they have an important role. And, and I'm not someone who throws stones at the multinational pharma companies. I think they that would be unfair. I think they have had a critical role and they've, prov- let's face it, they even pre-pandemic, they've provided a lot of the vaccine for the Gavi Alliance, um, for instance, and and the World Health Organization. And that needs to continue. But my point is to rely exclusively on the multinational companies. That's that's not a wise way to proceed. And we've seen that, that we need other mechanisms, including the vaccine producers in countries like India. We need to provide better support for them and for organizations like ours that are willing to do some of the prototype development and technology transfer. So I think there needs to be more balance in the vaccine production ecosystems between the multinationals, the the, with the, the group that calls itself the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network and some of the academic organizations. And that'll create a more robust system uh, for fairness and global vaccine equity. At what point can we estimate immunity due to the vaccine, herd immunity due to the vaccine, and and can declare the coronavirus pandemic an endemic rather than, rather than a pandemic? Well, I think the bar is high, right? I mean, when you talk about an agent like Omicron, which is almost as transmissible as measles, we know how high that bar has to be. We're talking about 90% vaccine coverage. And you might say, well, will that ever be possible? And the answer is, well, of course, we do it all the time for measles and other childhood infections. We should be do, able to do it for COVID-19, but it's a lot of work and you need a lot of vaccine. And all you need to do is the simple back of the envelope calculation, right? If you're talking about a, a planet of 7 billion people and three doses, you know, we're upwards of 20 billion doses. And, and that's why I think we're going to need vaccines like ours to help fill that gap. One of India's well-known virologist, Gagandeep Kang, uh, she recently said that we need to accept that there are going to be more variants, that there are going to be more waves. And every time there's a surge like this, we sort of have to prepare for it like we would a cyclone. And then, you know, once once it passes, we can get back on with our mm-hmm. lives. I was curious about what you think the shape of the pandemic will take in the future. Yes, yeah, so I, I work closely with Professor Kang. We- we co-edited a book together, Manson's Tropical Diseases, and she's an outstanding, an impressive individual and important in India science and global science. So she's absolutely right. The only uh, asterisk I would put on that is to say that this assumes we fail to vaccinate the world. And I do think that if we could redouble our efforts to make that commitment from the G7 and the G20 leaders to vaccinate the world, like we have other diseases, we do not have to live this way. And that, and that should be our aspirational goal. And hopefully this vaccine could contribute to that. All right. Thank you so much for your time and for speaking with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.